Rice Stadium, an empty shell waiting to be filled with the sounds of spectacle. Dolphins for lunch and supper and dinner, all at one time. Purple power! Purple power! Peter Eater! Go! Okay, boys! Okay! 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 There are times when an athletic event transcends the boundaries of sport and becomes embedded in a nation's consciousness. In eight seasons, the Super Bowl has become such an event. The Minnesota Vikings had come this way before, only to suffer a shocking loss to the underdog Kansas City Chiefs in Super Bowl IV. Now, four years later, they stood on the threshold again, but this time, they were the underdogs. In those same four years, the Miami Dolphins had risen from the dregs of the sport to a world championship. Today, they would defend that championship amid the celebration of Super Bowl VIII. emotional fever of Super Sunday, attention naturally focused on the superstars. But trailing just behind was a supporting cast almost out of place amid all the pre-game hoopla. For an offensive lineman, lack of public recognition is an accepted fact. These are obscure men with unfamiliar faces, which disappear behind helmet cages at game time and spend the duration lost in a confusing whirl along the line of scrimmage. Few fans know exactly what offensive linemen do. Fewer still can judge their performance. Unknown names and faces dwelling in the twilight zone of the sport, nonetheless holding the key to success or failure for any team. Miami had gathered its offensive line from the league's bargain basement. All five had arrived as discards, then blended into a superb unit. Original Dolphin Norm Evans came in the expansion draft from Houston. Bob Kuchenberg arrived as a free agent minor leaguer. Jim Langer came on waivers from Cleveland. Wayne Moore on waivers from San Francisco. And Larry Little originally signed as a free agent with San Diego. Today, the silent preparation of these anonymous men carried special significance. Their performance would determine the outcome of Super Bowl VIII. In Super Bowl VIII, the Miami Dolphins would try to duplicate Green Bay's back-to-back -back world championships. But Dolphin coach Don Shula was more concerned with the task at hand. In his own words, Shula describes his plan of attack. 
Going into Super Bowl VIII against the Minnesota Vikings, we felt one of the critical areas of the ball game would be the ability of our offensive line to handle Minnesota's great defensive line, and they predicate everything on coming off the ball as fast as they possibly can. Of course, they have tremendous athletes. Page is probably the best defensive tackle in football. We felt that uh, going into the ball game that we're going to be able to take advantage of this tremendous quickness of an Allen Page by cross blocking. On our cross block, our left tackle, Wayne Moore, comes down hard on Allen Page. If he's sliding to the inside, he takes himself out of the play. If he's sliding to the outside, he's coming right into the area that Wayne Moore is blocking down, and this nullifies his outside slant. Kuchenberg on this play lets Wayne Moore go first, and then he pulls to the outside, and he blocks out on their defensive end. The play was very effective, and it was only because the cross block was the type of blocking that should be used against these hard-charging defensive linemen. There were two plays that we had set up uh, in the ball game to take advantage of the experience of a Carl Eller and a Jim Marshall. Uh, Eller and Marshall have been playing so long that every time that they read the blocking pattern of the offensive line, they react instinctively to this blocking pattern. Uh, the play starts out as a trap on the defensive end. And when the defensive end reads and reacts tough to the inside, then the ball carrier, instead of cutting inside, continues to the outside. And we made everything look like it was the inside trap play. When Eller closed to the inside, then we still were able to get the ball outside to Mercury Morris, and it was a very effective play. Another way that we were able to make the defensive lines hesitate was misdirection. The offensive linemen pull in one direction, the backs start out like they're going with the, the offensive linemen, and then Larry Zonka comes back with the football against the flow, and this is a effective play because it starts out like it's going in one direction, and then it ends up going in the opposite direction, hence the term misdirection. The Dolphins had drawn first blood with a drive that approached perfection and set the tenor of what was to follow. The offensive line had been brilliant as they outmaneuvered, outflanked, outthought, and outright handled the feared purple people. Mixing cross blocks to take advantage of Page's quickness, negative influence traps to get outside Eller and Marshall, and misdirection. Miami swept 62 yards in 10 plays for a 7-0 lead. In the crucial opening confrontation, Miami's offensive line had met the foe and established a decided advantage. Now it was Minnesota's turn. The Vikings offensive line knew they had to retaliate quickly and they fired out with purpose. But for every Miami man handled, two more popped up in his place. Miami defense soars to greatness on pursuit, each man with a designated path to the ball carrier, spinning a systematic web of control, coordinated by discipline and determination. The many-headed monster of Miami pursuit was especially frustrating to Rookie of the Year Chuck Foreman, number 44. The Vikings would go the first 24 minutes of the game with only one first down. Miami buried Minnesota with pursuit and then turned the ball over to Bob Greasy. Much pre-game speculation surrounded Paul Warfield's pulled hamstring, so Greasy sent number 42 in motion, spreading the Minnesota secondary. 
With the flow going outside, Greasy dropped straight back, then looked over the middle and found Tight and Jim Mandage. Having already established the running game, Jim Langer and Bob Kuchenberg switched to pass protection, double teaming the furious rush of Alan Page, giving Greasy time to complete four for four in the first quarter. The fourth completion went to Marlon Briscoe inside the five. Then Jim Kick replaced Mercury Morris and performed his special day. With two plunges, Kick took the ball over for Miami's second touchdown. After one quarter of domination, the die had been hammered deep and the Dolphins were in complete control, 14 to nothing. Now the Dolphin defense turned to its 53. Bob Matheson carried in the 53 defense, providing an extra linebacker for Miami's own pass coverage. With a two touchdown advantage, the Dolphin zone was calculated to prevent long gains and make the short ones painful. Number 10, Fran Tarkington would complete more passes than any quarterback in Super Bowl history. But the swarming Dolphins kept control by shutting off the passes he needed most. Each time Talkington looked deep, his game-breaker was under wraps. Number 42, John Gilliam, drew a stifling Dolphin double team. And finally, Talkington ran out of time. While Miami's 53 defense handled the job of prevention, Don Shula paced the sideline, devising a new plan of attack for his offensive line. Early in the game, our cross block was effective against the hard-charging Alan Page and Jim Marshall. You could see the concern on the part of the Minnesota Vikings football team when they felt that they were being hurt, yet they knew that they were taking their own responsibilities. Then they started to be more cautious and this restrained them from charging as hard as they had been charging across the line of scrimmage. When we sensed this offensively, we decided to change our attack pattern to a more straight-on, man-on-man blocking pattern. And when the Minnesota linemen now started to wait to see what we were going to do, whether we were going to cross block or whether we were going to use negative influence and try to get the ball outside, then we were able to get on them in a hurry with our straight blocking move them off the line of scrimmage, and again, enable Zonka to find some running room. With a change of strategy, the Dolphin running attack now turned to simple, brute power. Larry Zonka and his escort, a perfect blend of back and line, man-on-man -man blocking and man-on-man -man ball carry. last, Minnesota ganged up to stop Zonka, inches short of a first down, leaving Garo Yupremian a chip shot from the 28. Zonka and his blockers had padded the lead to 17-0, and with time running out in the first half, the Minnesota offensive line had only one way to go. At last, Talkington found Gilliam deep and uncovered, and suddenly the Vikings were threatening. With time slipping away, Talkington bootlegged his team even closer.
the fourth down at the Dolphin Six, Tarkington came up three inches short, and the Viking bent sent in word to go for it. These are the moments that test the true mettle of a champion. One minute, four seconds remaining, fourth down, time to dig in, time to reach down, time to find out which team wants it the most. Out of the pile rose the Miami Dolphins victorious. A replay shows why. For an instant, the Vikings had split the Dolphin defensive line, and number 62, Ed White, was leading Oscar Reed to the end zone. But number 85, Nick Bonaconte, closed quickly to meet Reed at the line of scrimmage, jarring the ball loose in first down territory. Miami's Jake Scott decided the issue with a diving recovery. Once again, a key confrontation had fallen to Miami. Minnesota's sudden uprising had yielded not one point, and the half ended with the Vikings discouraged and down 17-0. The Miami Dolphins returned for the second half with a comfortable pad and overinflated confidence. On the first play, John Gilliam quickly brought them back to reality. Gilliam flashed for 65 yards, but back upfield, a clipping penalty cost the Vikings 45 yards of field position. The reprieve gave Manny Fernandez and the Dolphin defense a chance to regroup and handle a new Minnesota tactic. Fernandez stacked over center, then Tarkington sprinted out in an attempt to clear Dolphin pursuit. Fernandez never gave him a chance. While the Miami defense picked up where it had left off, Paul Warfield loosened up on the sideline, waiting to add another dimension to the Dolphin attack. Warfield had limped through the first half, acting as a decoy, protecting a pull hamstring, waiting for just the right moment to cut loose. Now, on Miami's first possession of the second half, Don Chula called his signal, and Warfield exploded upfield. The tender muscle had responded, and natural greatness did the rest. This was a day of destiny for the Miami Dolphins, a day when even their own mistakes could not defeat them. As he drove his team toward another TD, Bob Greasy realized he had forgotten the snap count. He turned to ask his backfield, but they didn't know either. So he turned back to take his chances. Somehow it all worked out just beautifully. Larry Zonka blasted in and the broken play gave Miami an awesome 24 to nothing advantage. To Don Shula, the source of this domination was obvious. When our straight blocking began to become effective, then we realized that we were controlling the line of scrimmage. Now we were the team that was winning the battle up front. But after you win the battle up front, then you have to continue to work for position follow through. There are some tremendous shots of Bob Kuchenberg keeping his position on Alan Page as the ball moves to the outside. This is what we call position follow through. And by being able to do this, then Kuchenberg continues to build this wall between Alan Page and the ball carrier. The Vikings had been pushed around and penalized all afternoon. Finally, their cool veneer wore thin, and angry rumblings began to break through. Yeah. 
Down on the sidelines, the game is more intense, more real. Now, although hopelessly behind, the aroused Vikings would strike back in anger at the source of all their frustrations. Right! Split right! Hey! Slide power 21 on one. Fittingly, Minnesota's last foray ended in frustration as an offside penalty negated a successful onside kick. At last, the joy of Super Sunday had all drained away. The Minnesota Vikings had been decisively defeated, but it was more a result of Miami brilliance than their own failure. Minnesota had simply met the irresistible force and had been crushed. Defensive end Carl Eller summed it up best when he said, I have never seen a more dominating team than the Miami Dolphins. All afternoon I had the feeling that the outcome had already been decreed on high before we even took the field. It seemed I could hear Scottish bagpipes in the distance, keeping time as they came after us, wave after wave, gaining ground so easily they seemed to be floating in suspended animation. It was a weird, surrealistic scene, as if we were on the sidelines, watching our own struggle, yet being powerless to do anything about it. After a while, it was obvious they could not be stopped. For Carl Eller and the Minnesota Vikings, Super Bowl VIII was a strange nightmare. For the Miami Dolphins, it was a dream of near perfection, a performance unequaled in Super Bowl history. As time ran out, accolades rained down on the Miami superstars. Larry Zonka had convinced the nation of his greatness with a Super Bowl record 145 yards rushing and was named player of the game. But there were others who shared at least equally in his accomplishment Five anonymous men had turned in a performance of artistry and rare beauty that few who watched the game were even aware of. Yet their coach and teammates knew, in the end, the game ball was in appropriate hands, as the Miami Dolphins, one and all, earned the right to be called world champions.